Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Rangers Review morning briefing for Thursday, the 19th of August. It's game day as we look ahead to the Alice Kurt uh, Europa League playoff uh, first leg between Rangers and the Armenian champions. I'm joined by Joshua Barry and Johnny McFarlane. Before we touch on tonight's game, gentlemen, um, let's talk about uh, reports that sort of surfaced yesterday. Uh, Rangers interested in the Huddersfield midfielder Janino Bacuna, the uh, Curachal uh, uh, internationalist. Um, he's been there a few years now. Uh, Joshua, you've done a piece on the website about him, what, what we can expect uh, if that move was to materialise. Uh, what did you find? Um, that's a good question. I don't know how to succinctly put it because I did. I watched a lot of them, um, and what I think I found was: listen, it's easy to always get excited about a player and just look at their good bits. And in terms of stats, he didn't jump out um, as as a player who was kind of outperforming his club, who was creating loads of chances that strikers weren't taking. But doing a bit of background research on him and kind of trying to marry that up with the stats and a little bit of the video. It, it looked like a, a sign in that if it's a, if, if it's a, a a low monetary fee, which given he's out of contract next season, you'd imagine so. I w- I would be behind it. So he, he's a, he's played everywhere, um, but I think he's more comfortable going forward from midfield. Technically, he's very good. He's he's got that kind of language style that Kamara and Aribo have in, in going past players. He he played he played a hundred games in the Edervise. Uh, Dutch league, however, I've probably butchered the pronunciation, but Era de Vise. Era de Vise, there we go. We played uh, or, or 90 games by the time he was 20, under 21 um, Dutch side. Um, so, it, you know, as an excellent player, moved to Huddersfield at 20, and then equally has played in a team in Huddersfield that have had three disastrous seasons, were relegated from the Premiership, and then famously were quite badly run and finished 18th and 20th. So, I think you just got to take the environment in it. And in the piece, we talk about how look, before Glenn Kamara joined Rangers, he was on the bench and, and Martin Woods was playing, um, as, as you touched on, Johnny, in your long read piece on him on the deal to sign Glenn Kamara. Before we signed Leon Balogun, he'd just been relegated uh, from, the, from the championship. You know, even Scott Wright the season before Rangers signed him wasn't really pulling up trees at Aberdeen. So just reasoning that if you take a player who obviously has a lot of raw talent, a lot of raw, raw ability, and you see that when he plays. You can tell with players the way they receive the ball and and, uh, and and just from clips, you can tell the technical ability they have. And I really think that maybe this is a player who Rangers could really harness that ability, could make it work in a system. And the thing is, the thing that excited me most about Derek was you look at him and he's played right back, defensive midfield, attack midfield. And, you know, athletically, he's very quick as well. And you see that with a lot of the goals he scored. But if you can if you can coach that into one of the wide midfielders, uh, wide central midfielders, um, in that four three three system, he seems to have the ability to to you know get get back down the pitch, but also affect the game in the in the final third. So you know he, he's a, he's at Huddersfield for a reason as well because he's you know got a lack of consistency, and as I say, stats don't necessarily jump out and and slap you in the face in terms of this is a player we desperately need. But I think if you marry that up a little bit with some video and, and a little bit of his background, it could be an, an exciting signing for Rangers. We'll wait and see. Yeah, but I spoke to um, Matt Glenn, who's a former Huddersfield goalkeeper. He does the co-coms for uh, BBC uh, West Yorkshire and, and covers Huddersfield week in, week out. His, his words for me was, he's a tremendous talent, but so inconsistent, it's painful at times. can be the best player on the pitch and score a ridiculous individual goal, but two minutes later, not track his man and cost his team. So uh, pretty much marries up with what you say, Joshua. In terms of you, Johnny, is this a sort of signing that, that would excite you? Well, it's one of the ones on the face of it, you look at it and think, well, he's been at Huddersfield since 2018. But I think we've moved past that that, that kind of uh, narrow view of players. Doing. And, and what we do is we take a deeper dive into what they can, they can offer because we know, looking through history, that, that the the context of a player isn't even ninety. Per, it's not the full story, that's for sure. Um, you know, you, you look across the history of Scottish football, and these players that are written off before they signed, and then all of a sudden they're they're excellent signings. And uh, Joshua talks about Leon Balogun, uh, Glenn Kamara. People wouldn't have thought Glenn Kamara was good enough to to make an impact on on Rangers team. They would have thought he's a he's a decent squad player who can come in and and, and operate well in certain games. But you know, now he's a he's a 
he's a major fulcrum of the of the, of the side. So I, th I think we need to obviously drill into the detail and, and see what he can offer. Joshua, the one question I wanted to ask you was, does he line up quite in terms of similarities with Bongani Zungu? Because Zungu is a player who could play in attacking positions or drop deep as well. There seems to be a a type that they're looking for, which is a guy who can kind of do everything. Who can who's comfortable dropping into deeper positions, but also has the skill set to, to go past the man and, and get forward. I think he's more. He looks more of an offensive-minded player than Zungu. But I, I, uh, David Wagner, when he signed him, said he had all the kind of the. I can't remember the exact quote, but he was basically saying he's he's blessed with all the technical ability of offen, of an offensive midfielder, but has the the kind of athletic qualities as well that's needed from from a defensive midfielder. And uh, I wrote a long piece about two weeks ago about Glenn Kamara, about the kind of rise of press-resistant midfielders, and Aribo falls into this bracket as well, and the need to, in an in a increasingly press-heavy sport, they need to uh, counter that. And one of the ways teams counter that is is by having midfielders like Glenn Kamara. And I think you've seen that in the Malmo game. They were able to press the two Rangers centre-backs, knowing that Rangers were going to, especially in the first leg, struggle to progress the ball through the midfield because only Stephen Davis was really comfortable dropping in, taking the ball under pressure, maybe turning a man. It's not really our field's game and we don't know enough about Lundstrom yet to, to make a judgment. So I'd say he's more of a... I, I, I don't think if he was to come in, um, and I could be wrong, but I don't think if he, he was to come in, he'd be playing the six. I think he'd be more more of an eight. Um, again, because I think he looks at his best when he's... Um, I mean, he scored a few, a few really good goals where he'll, he'll start a move and end a move kind of and drive up the pitch. But maybe it is, it, he is a player who... Because equally, he's, looking back at his time at Groningen, he did play a little bit deeper and, and has good vision from there as well. So, I, I mean, I, I think arguably he could probably play any midfield role. And you see that in the fact that last season he played right back, uh, left back, left midfield, attacking midfield. But arguably, I'd say that equally that he's at 24 now. He's had a lot of potential and he needs a team and a coach that are going to get the best out of him and an environment that's going to get the best out of him. And arguably... If you put him with Michael Beale and Stephen Jarrod, I think you could coach him into a really good kind of box-to-box -box midfielder for Rangers, who, as Derek said, will probably need to up his, you know, defensive discipline. But I think going forward, he could, he could, he could really impact games as well. So, a little bit more offensive than Bongani Zungu, but may, maybe he could, he could do the six as well. I we guess we'll just have to wait and see if the if the, if the signing does occur. Yeah, a big hello to everyone getting involved with the, the programme this morning. Hi to, to Scott and James, for James from Australia. Good to have you along with us. He seems to think we need a great number 10 uh, to break down the, the low block most games. Uh, I think Rangers have a number of them, do they not, Johnny? The likes of Hadji and uh, Kent, what have you, Scott? Well, you can now. never have too many skillful <laughs> players, um, especially with the games that Rangers, the type of games, I'll use one of Josh's phrases, the game state that Rangers face um, quite often, which is going up against these teams who, who defend deep. So you need someone who can um, who can create something out of nothing, who can pick a pass. I think we saw that, for example, with Yanis uh, Hadji against Dunfermline, with that unbelievable through ball in transition that he played, just, just with one touch, ball away. Um, and, and I think I think that's so important. And and, and listen, the, the kind of price that Rangers are spending um, for players, you're going to get mercurial talents, guys who are just finding their feet in football, guys who are rough diamonds who need to be polished. So they're going to be a bit inconsistent. We've seen that with with, with Haji certainly. We see it with Ryan Kent at times. So if you've got a few more of these guys with the ability to unlock doors. Um, then, then you, you you try and bring them in, and and I think uh, for us guys who are, are a little bit older, and remember back to to a very successful period under Alex McLeish, um, the on the left side of Rangers front three there was um, Neil McCann and, and Peter Lovenkrantz, and when McCann wasn't in form, Lovenkrantz came in, uh, and they were they were fighting for that that jersey, and when and when um, Lovenkrantz wasn't performing, McCann came in. And it meant you had a pretty consistent level of quality on that left side because they were always fighting for that position and they were always switching and they were always trying to usurp each other. And I think you need that across the team. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't I don't, think you can have uh, too many of those type of players, really, to be honest. Yeah, uh, you touched on the Hadji. Um, that leads us on. There's a great article on the website uh, today, folks, from Stevie Clifford on uh, Yanis Hadji's uh, value to that that ranger side so do go check it out uh that leads us on then the big game tonight uh alice kurt in the 
Europa League uh, playoff uh, round first leg. It's not a competition Rangers wanted to be in, let's be honest, last week, but they are, and it's a huge game in terms of getting to the group stages. Um, Joshua, you'll be covering the game. Um, you've done your, your homework on Alish Kurt. What can we expect? Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think they're that great, is, uh, but I don't <laughs> want to say that because I don't... <laughs> I don't want to be disrespectful and I don't want to come back to bite me. But I mean, they've locked. You're the one that gave us all that hope ahead of the Marvel man. man. I, know, exactly. <laughs> I know. So my confidence is gone. But no, I mean, you look at, uh, I think they're ranked 179th. And I think for context, in the UEFA coefficient rankings, Aberdeen are 151. So they're, they're uh, and they've lost their two opening fixtures in the Armenian League 2 0 and 3 0. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to look at them and think they're going to possess loads and loads of quality and really hurt Rangers offensively. And equally, uh, uh, Chris Jack did a great um, interview, which is on the Rangers Review site as well, looking at Alish Kurt and their rise, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the person he was interviewing has good knowledge of, of Armenian football was saying that they they're, they have a very weak defence. So, you know, if you're coming to Ibrox to 50,000 people and, and you're up against Kent Morelos and... Hadji and maybe a Rebo, you, 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 I, I don't have much confidence that that, that won't be breached. Um, they, they, they uh, against Kai Rate, they won uh, three two in, in the second leg, and, and uh, the big striker whose name escapes me, and I think it's Embalo, scored a couple of really impressive goals. Okay. In the second one, especially on the break, was w w was impressive. But um, but equally in their game, the, the thing that stuck out to me, Derek, was in their game against uh, Sheriff, who the Moldovan side, who I think beat Dinamo Kiev quite convincingly recently. Um, they uh, they didn't, they just didn't look great. And and there's little things I always look out for from watching a team in terms of how they're using the ball from goal kicks or how they're shooting. And the thing that two things that stuck out to me in that game was they took one shot within the box and they took seven or eight from about thirty yards. And it was getting quite ridiculous where you see them getting to thirty yards and you think. Couple more passes, he's into the box, and they just took a lot of pop shots. So if you're in BF1 tonight, <laughs> young guard. And um, the other thing was from goal kicks, they they just they didn't really have to seem a, a, have a, a clear plan of how they were going to progress the ball at the pitch. So I I would uh, with caveat that I got the Malmo game pretty wrong. I would say that it would be quite convincing for Rangers tonight. Um, but you never know with these ties. It would be more difficult, I think, if we're going away from home first. Um, and away goals existed in the second leg. But I think because you can kind of go for broke tonight, I'd, I'd fancy Rangers to, to get a few goals. Yeah, James Burrell also fancies Rangers. He's going for 5 0 tonight. Uh, hello as well to, to Billy getting involved with the programme this morning. Um, Johnny, we've got our predicted lineups on the website. Go check it out. But um, you've opted for Leon Balligan over <laughs> Phil Hollander again. Why? <laughs> well, yes, I was getting slaughtered for this uh, before we started, so um, I was I was kind of waiting for this on tenterhooks. Um, no, listen, I'll tell you what it is. Predicted lineup is obviously not necessarily the lineup that I would choose, but what I think the manager will go for. Sometimes it's a bit of a mix of the two, to be honest. But on this occasion, I just think Rangers will want to try and put this tie to bed. You know, I, I see people in the comments saying five nil, three nil. That that's the kind of result that Rangers will want because. There's another sort of elephant in the room, which is the, 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 the old firm game on the Sunday after the second leg, and that's a massively important match. So I think Rangers will ideally want this tie put to bed. Now, listen, it might not happen, it, it, and, and Rangers have to play every game at a time, you know, one game at a time. But if they can go out today and attack, and attack with intent, and put this beyond Alish Kerr, it means that they've got a few more options in terms of rotation for the second leg, which should be handy with such a big game on the Sunday. Um, so I think with that in mind, Gerard will adopt a similar strategy to how what he adopted against Malmo, which is the team will be pressing high up the pitch, and they'll need the pace in behind. And I don't think the fact that Balogun had a poor second half in that game will... We'll stop him. Now, you say that Alish Kurt have a physical centre-half, so that might change things, Joshua. They might think, well, you know, in that case, it's not the pace that's the problem. It's the physicality, and they'll play Hel Helander. But looking at the amount of times Balogun's been selected for Europa League games, I think it was five out of six yeah. last season. I don't think Steven Gerrard is going to have his mind necessarily changed because there's a few people that are upset with, um, with, with Balogun's performance, quite rightly, because he was poor in that second leg. Um, against Malmo. 
see if you're Phil Hollander though, you're not going to be happy being shunned for. I mean, he's been brought into the club to play these big matches. If if you're not trusted to play against Armenian opposition, you're going to have you're you're not going to be too happy, are you? No, no, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't be happy. But I mean, the way that Rangers operate is a. It's a squad game, you know, they're, they're rotating quite a lot. There isn't really a, a fixed starting 11. I mean, Josh had wrote about this in recent days that it tends to be horses for courses, depends on the game, what the starting 11 is going to be and who the, who the first choice is going to be. So I think Philip Hallander by now will, will be aware of that. Um, but listen, he's going to get plenty of games, uh, even if he doesn't make this one. And listen, he, he might well make it. He might well make it. <laughs> I just I feel based on looking back over the last season and a half that, that if they're going to go and attack and going to go and try and put this game to bed, which I think will be the internal message, then it might be Balogun that starts. Yeah, right. Before we, we go, uh, some score predictions, lads. Well, Tracy Hill thinks it's going to be 2-0. Uh, James Skeen, 3-0. Uh, Callum reckons it's going to be a 6-0 victory. What say you, Joshua? Uh, <clears throat> firstly, I admire Callum's uh, <laughs> bravery to predict 6-0. I don't think it's improbable that it's a high-scoring game. I think if you score a couple of early goals or an early goal, again, I don't I don't think Alish Kurt are going to be able to defend the penalty box. I haven't watched a little bit of them, though. The entire game, I I would maybe say three 0 to Rangers. Um, that is that is middle ground, not too optimistic, not too pessimistic, and, and probably won't land me in hot water. Johnny, I'm just going to copy shamelessly copy Joshua on this one because that's actually what I was thinking that's beforehand. True. You know, I've not watched enough of Alish Kirk to sit down here and say, and probably Joshua has. He spent three or four hours looking at them, but he, that's probably still not enough to to realistically assess it from from a score point of view. But I think Rangers should win comfortably. Um, just if all the data suggests that Rangers should go out and, and and sort this one out in this leg. You know, sometimes football has has a strange way of um, knocking you when you think you're you're in a good situation. But um, I don't see why they'll struggle against uh, a team from Armenia. Yeah, no, I'm going 4 0 as is uh, James uh, as well. That'll do us there, folks. Remember, you can subscribe to the Rangers Review for only two ninety nine a month and support top quality journalism covering the club you love. I hope your team, team wins uh, this evening. We'll be back with all the reaction tomorrow in Friday's morning briefing. And of course, we'll bring you all the reaction from the game as well. But until then, bye for now. <laughs>